And uh, Representative Morrison, we're going to have uh, House File 1885 um, in front of us here. And let me look. Where's the... Okay. So House File... I'll move that House File 1885 be referred to Ways and Means. Representative Morrison, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House File 1885 will increase the surcharge on watercraft licenses from five to twenty dollars over three years, to be paid over three years. Uh, this fee will provide more funding for the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, which is critical to doing long-term research, and will also help lake associations who pay for the management of much of AIS so that lakes can remain usable by the public. I do have a testifier with me today. Very good. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and, and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jeff Forster, um, and I represent Minnesota uh, Lakes and Rivers Advocates, and we would be in support of this bill. Um, a little background. The AIS surcharge on watercraft hasn't been increased since it was put in place back in the um, 1980s. I think 1989 was the year. Um, there was a couple dozen lakes that were infested with AIS at that point. Now we're close to 700. Um, so just from that standpoint, it's, uh, it, it seems like it's time to catch up. Um, lake associations often bear the costs for managing aquatic invasive species, so treating the lakes to reduce the spread. Um, for instance, Lake Coronas is spending $70,000 a year to treat starry stonewort at the public access, which reduces the risk of it being spread to other lakes because the concentration is lower in, um, you know, at boat ramps. Uh, some lakes are spending, you know, over $100,000 a year on this. The DNR at one time had a grant program uh, similar to what's described in this bill that helped defray some of those costs. and. As their workload has increased, they had to cut that back um, a few years ago. Um, and this also, I think, supports the effort to create more of a comprehensive program. So if we look at AIS, we need the DNR doing inspections. The counties have a role to play with their local resource managers. Um, restoring budget to the DNR through the surcharge would help them with training and outreach and coordination between the counties and what the counties are doing. Uh, obviously, research is one of our best opportunities, uh, but it's hard to do long-term research when you don't have a reliable um, source of funding uh, to do long-term uh, query. And then lake associations have a role to play because they're the ones that are on the ground. So um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to do my best to answer them, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I guess this is really for the bill author. Um, have we explored any other uh, funding uh, streams? We've got uh, a lot of dedicated funds that uh, we do through lottery, through sales tax uh, that are directly supposed to benefit the, uh, the habitat uh, since the invasive species things is a constantly dynamic changing thing. I, I, I would uh, hope we don't consider those dedicated funds as can't be used because that's a, a level of effort uh, within the DNR because there's something new pops up every year. So I guess what types of other ways have we looked at to fund this? Mr. Chair, Representative Lewick, I, I think that the thought is that since this fee has not been raised since 1989, and it already is a pretty low fee, and it applies directly in that the votes that, quite frankly, spread aquatic invasive species, it seems like a logical place to, to increase the fees very slightly, really. Representative Ms. Chair, a little bit of follow-up in there. So, um, there are a lot of slum, you know smaller watercraft that uh, uh, I guess you know I think of boats. Yeah, there's a uh, fifty thousand dollar boat on a twenty thousand dollar trailer behind an eighty thousand dollar pickup. Uh, but what about the smaller watercraft that have to be licensed uh, that may not ever leave the lake? Are, are, is there any exemption or way to to deal with that, or is this just going to get one size fits all? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Lewick. You know, the $20 fee is a starting point. I, I think that this will probably get sorted out, hopefully, in the Finance Division. 
um, once we get there, assuming we do from ways and means. Um, but I, the, your point is well taken. There, there are different kinds of boats. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would, I would ask for a roll call vote on, uh, on uh, this item. Uh, thank you. So noted. Other Representative Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the testifier or the bill author, um, part of the money for this fee is going to go to uh, local lake associations. I like that, but sometimes they have a difficult uh, time coming up with a with a match. Will this require a match from uh, lake associations to qualify for this grant as well? Hmm? Okay. Um, or, sure. Mr. Speak. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I am not certain. I, I believe as it's written, it would not. Can we, but can can we check with... Um, okay, go ahead. Mr. But perhaps we can get a reading on it from someone who's better able to read this language. <laughs> okay, we'll ask research for it. Please proceed <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chair, members, the language right now does not specify that a match would be required, whether or not the DNR implemented one would be to them. Well, thanks again, Mr. Chair. But as I recall, some of the earlier grant money going to counties uh, did require a match. So is this going to be confusing? Is it going to be two separate pots of money going to counties and lake associations, one requiring a match and one not requiring a match? That's just a question that I'd pose to, uh, to the bill author as this bill moves along to see, to clarify that, that situation. <coughs> Any comments, Representative Marcus? Mr. Chair, Representative, that's a good point. We'll have to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I'm reading the bill here, I'm not seeing it, but maybe I've missed it to the bill author Representative Morrison, is there any kind of an exemption for my nonprofit organizations, my camps? We've talked about that in previous committees. Uh, this is absolutely a massive issue in my district with dozens and dozens of camps and thousands of canoes and all sorts of other kinds of watercraft. Am I missing it, or what's the purpose, or where is, there, is it here or not? Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Heinzman. I don't believe that it is in this version, but again, this is a starting point, and that's certainly something that, that we can talk about and consider. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, it would be, I think, a, a really wise move to consider exempting them. We're talking about kids literally that wouldn't go to camp because of something like this, and it wouldn't just be a couple. We're talking about probably hundreds of kids, and we're talking about a lot of donated money to even make that possible for them and putting something like this together on organizations that literally never move their boats. Their, their equipment stays in the lake and will never leave until it's probably no good. Uh, I hope you take that very seriously. Perhaps, Representative Heinzman, there could be in, uh, in this process uh, education for these youngsters about AIS in lieu of um, a stamp like that. We should be educating those youngsters, so. I don't, yes, sir. wouldn't disagree, Mr. Chair. I just, I'm always nervous when we have some kind of a mandate from the state of Minnesota. I understood. <laughs> Representative Becker, can uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I did just want to point out as we talk about the cost, it's a three-year license. So um, we're still only looking at $6.67 per year. Um, I only own a canoe, uh, and I don't have any trouble paying that. I understand there may be members who own 13 boats, um, but even if you owned 13 boats, you're still only looking at $86.71 um, for all of those boats total. So I think the, um, you know, it, it's a very small amount to pay for something that's absolutely very important. So I uh, thank you for bringing this forward, and I think, um, to, to the previous comments, I think, you know, looking at ways that we're not um, negatively impacting a, a nonprofit camp, um, we can easily, you know, amend it to, to make it make sense um, for that. But I will say there are also camps that compete in regattas and, you know, sailing competitions and all kinds of other um, events where they are transporting boats 
um, from lake to lake. So I would uh, just want to point that out as well, but do thank you for bringing it forward. It's a good bill. Thank you. Um, you have, uh, oh, Representative Bull. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there a companion bill for this in the Senate? Representative Morton. Mr. Chair, Representative Bull, we are looking for a Senate author. Mm -hmm. Very good. Other, uh, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Morrison, in subdivision four on page two, line 2.8, when we're talking about the uh, account, um, what about just using the LCCMR dollars for that instead of, if all Minnesotans benefit from aquatic invasive species research and so forth, why wouldn't we? Why are we just uh, targeting uh, watercraft owners? <coughs> Representative Moore. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian, uh, I believe part of the idea is to increase the amount of available resources to study aquatic invasive species. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, you can do that with the LCCMR money going to the Aquatic Invasive mm -hmm. Species Research Center. Mm -hmm. That's my point. Um, and then, uh, can you walk me through exactly what kind of what is the the process that's used at DNR for a lake association to apply for a grant? Representative Morrison. Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian, uh, I would defer to my testifier for that question. If you're able to help me with that. Um, um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, maybe um, Bob Meyer can describe it in detail. I've never applied for a grant, but uh, as I understand it, they would open the granting process and it was a first come, first serve basis. Um, Lake associations would apply through the DNR and um, and then receive the money in time to do the treatments over the summer. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, members for the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner DNR. I have with me Ann Pierce, our Deputy Director of Ecological Water Resources as well. Um, just to clear up a couple things, we do require a match for our grant program. In the past, this grant program has been eliminated because of the need to provide resources to uh, ensure the county dollars. So that, just so people know, there's $10 million of local government aid that goes through the tax committee that's distributed to counties based upon the number of water access sites they have and the number of parking spots they have for AIS related activities. So they do inspections, they do education, they fund staff, things like that. We reduced our grant program several years ago to, to make sure that we had the resources available to provide the, the assistance counties need. We have to train over a thousand, there's a, over a thousand county funded inspectors that are inspecting watercraft as well. We need to make sure that they're, they're educated, they're certified, they're, they're doing this in a way to not create a problem at the boat landing, so to speak. Some of these times, uh, sometimes things at boat landings could get kind of heated if we don't manage them the right way. So there's all those assistance activities that we decided we needed to spend money on from our existing dollars rather than the grant program. This, this bill would reinstate funding for that grant program as with the DNR's AIS surcharge increase within the governor's budget, but there would be a lot less activities under the governor's budget initiatives. So with that uh, backdrop, I'm gonna let Ann Pierce talk about how we do our grant program and what that looks like. Please introduce yourself. I'm Ann Pierce, uh, Deputy Director of Ecological and Water Resources with the DNR Chairman, committee members. Um, we, at this point, when we, last did our grant program, what we try to do is just distribute the money um, evenly out to the people who are applying it. So at, at one time we had quite a bit of grant money, around 900,000. We were able to give each applicator um, a fairly good share of their cost. And so their share was maybe around 50%, ours was around 50%. As we lost that money, we still wanted to distribute it so that people who needed it could get it, but their share of the cost then went up because of that. So the way we try to do it is, especially those first set of grants that come in in the spring, pretty much everyone gets a grant. It's just, as our money was reduced, it got to be a smaller amount. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Pierce, do, um, does the <clears throat> agency charge an administrative fee against uh, the grant application? So if there's 900000 in the account, how much actually gets out the door? Does the DNR withhold some for administrative costs? Chairman, Please. committee members, no. Not, if there's 900000 for grants, 900000 goes out. Sometimes, however, just to... If you apply for a grant and for whatever reason you can't get that treatment done, then that grant money still is sitting there, right? So if a lake association applied for a grant and it came to July and the con weather conditions weren't right or whatever that might be, they may have remaining grant money. That money would come back to us and then we'd redistribute it again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, just a general comment, a couple, of few weeks ago, the several of the resort owners were visiting me in my office and they're talking about um, how they're watching every dime and so forth in their business operation. It's becoming more and more important um, and more and more difficult for what I would call the mom and pop resorts to make ends meet and uh, I'm concerned about this on them. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I just might briefly address a question that the committee had regarding boats that don't leave lakes. Even if you have a boat that sits on a boat lift, um, that doesn't mean that you're not a possible vector for bringing an AIS into that water body. What we see is people who have uh, make sure that have docks and have water lifts, some of those people buying new equipment or moving equipment, even though there's a 21 day decontamination period. So if you're buying a new dock or boat lift, you have to keep your, prop, your, your old system out of the water, like on your front lawn or someplace for 21 days before you can sell it. We've seen that the substantial infestations have occurred because of people bringing in a used boat lift from one boat water body or another. For example, if somebody were to sell, and this is a case I dealt with last year, this person on Lake Minnetonka, zebra mussels, other issues infested, <coughs> wanted to sell their boat lift to somebody up north. They said, what do I do? And I said, hold on, you have to wait 21 days, things like that. The movement of these water-related equipment that we call, talk about is something that we're very concerned about as well. I know Otter Tail County is talking about registering docks so they can track where dock movements are going. So just because you may have a boat and you keep it on your lake year-round doesn't mean there's a poten not a potential for you to bring in uh, some vector that would cause that water to become infested. Representative Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So just to clarify, uh, with this new reinstated DNR program, we're looking at a 50% match to lake associations. Is that correct? So um, basically depends on how much money that surcharge will generate for the grant. So how much, how many boats of those $2 that go to the grants, how much would that add up to? And so if it's probably going to be somewhere between 400,000 and 700,000 or something like that. And so depending on where it lies, the more it is, the more we can match. But there's a certain cost per acre for treatment that, you know, the herbicide costs and all that. So what we will still try to do is distribute that evenly and um, the, the person applying for it then would have to pay the rest of the cost of the treatment. And it'll depend on how much we get, how much is brought in from that surcharge. So if you have 600,000 boats compared to 800,000 boats, you're going to have potentially $400,000 coming in from the 600,000 boats and potentially 900,000 coming in from the 8,000 boats. So then you would have a different pot of money to deal with. Mr. Chairman, just really quickly on that. We'll work with the author and, and the stakeholders and, and Representative Anderson, if you wish to be involved in that conversation on what parameters should be put around this, what should the match be. I think it's important to have some level of match, but again, that level of match will provide for how much grants we can provide out there as well. So we'll be looking for legislative input and guidance on that. And Ms. Pierce is absolutely right. It's this whole thing and the author, is, it's scalable. How much do we want to do? How much prevention? How many grants do we want to do? What should the surcharge look like, and who should be paying for it? So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm realizing that I should probably add a little bit of background. I made a comment specifically about transporting boats, and I'm not sure. Maybe the commissioner and I think maybe Representative Becker Finn also mentioned something 
haven't been privy to some of the conversations. I have lots of lake associations in my district. And there's an ongoing conversation about boats being transported from other places all over the state of Minnesota, two lakes in my district. And we're troubleshooting, trying to figure out how do we avoid that contamination coming from other places. And there's those that would like to do some pretty drastic things like close accesses, which obviously that's a problem. And then there's others that have talked about possibly incentivizing people to keep boats in one location as opposed to transporting them. And we may incentivize them by lowering some fees or other things. Those are just ideas that lake associations are talking about. You may not know about that, but that is a part of the conversation. And by raising fees on boats that are literally bought, brand new, put in a body of water in front of a camp, oftentimes a camp that's funded through donations, and it never leaves that body of water, there may be something there that we need to look at to try to incentivize them. Or in this particular case, I would probably be looking to completely exempt my nonprofit camps. Mr. Chairman, on that start. note, if you want to upset the resorting community, tell the resorts that their customers can't bring their own boat into their resort. I've had conversations with them before, and obviously if, if we want to prohibit the movement of boats, it's one thing, but I know, you know there's a lot of people who invest a lot of money in their boats, and they want to take them up to Lake X, Y, or Z to go fishing, so it's just something we need to be careful if we're looking at that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Commissioner. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is there a way to incentivize people to when they come to a lake to maybe rent a boat as opposed to bring one? That is a conversation that's happening at, uh, inside lake associations. That's not something I'm telling the DNR that needs to be done. That's not something that I think is even really a bigger part of the conversation because it was brought up by yourself and Representative Becker Finn were having that conversation right now and that's why there needs to be a clarification. This is something that lake associations are talking about as they're troubleshooting, how do we stop aquatic invasive species? Very good. Reverend Blue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> I guess this is primarily for the DNR. Uh, at least the, uh, the counties I'm familiar with in my district both have got very aggressive uh, local programs funded through that uh, process you talked about, where we get the local, to get the money down to the local. Uh, level. They've invested in a huge amount of equipment uh, uh, using a variety of county resources plus volunteer resources. So this grant program, um, if, if it did go, go back into effect, uh, how would the DNR uh, look? Would they look down at the local level, uh, for example, uh, see exactly what Crow Wing County or Aiken County is doing relative to working with lake associations before they kind of went in on top and said, oh, we're going we're gonna to do this. Uh, it would seem like we're setting ourselves up here for uh, potentially a conflict. Uh, it would make, to me, it might make sense to, to, to let, uh, you know, one person ride the horse as opposed to sticking two or three on the back and maybe confusing the horse. We've got the horse up there. <laughs> Ms. Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Committee members, yeah, so we are working with a lot of the counties, and the counties are investing differently, but most of them are investing in the prevention side of things, which is the inspectors. And, you know, we we would be happy to continue to work, like um, Commissioner Meyer said, we'd be happy to continue to work with people to see how this kind of money would be distributed and what those um qualifications would be and how we determine how to distribute it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, <clears throat> the important thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it costs money to get the mo to, to get money down there to manage a grant. And so we've we've got some counties that are doing um, essentially that uh, in a variety of ways. And so rather to run dual uh, approaches, it would seem like we'd uh, it might be a little more efficient to stick with, with one way, get more money down there. Uh, uh, that, that's my thoughts, at least looking at the, uh, uh, what I hear from the Lakeshore Associations, my, the resorters in my area, plus the county, is that um, they've really, over time, built a really solid, aggressive uh, approach. And like you say, right now, uh, that approach is, is uh, uh, really focused on on prevention uh, but as i drive around in my district i see uh, equipment sitting there and people literally at 
uh, all kinds of accesses uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so I, I've, been, I've just got some great reservations here that we're, we need more funds. Uh, there's, I mean, that, that, that's, that's always a problem, but I, I just see that this is a, maybe we should send those funds directly to the county as opposed to uh, uh, reinstating a, a program or, or boning up a program that's kind of run from St. Paul down here as opposed to at the local level. Mr. Chairman, yeah. Mr. just really briefly on that, I know we have other bills in the committee. We have regional aquatic invasive species yeah. specialists in all four regions of our state that work very closely with the counties in their districts. So there is, it's, it's to take some words from Mr. Forrester, as we were talking earlier, it's a three-legged stool. It's research, it's prevention, and it's inspection. And we're making sure that we're working very coordinatedly, hand-in-hand -hand with the counties throughout the state, understanding what their needs are, trying to work with them on how to increase or support their activities that are there, but also work with the lake associations and, and fund these grant activities that they, they would like to see reinstated. So we're working very closely to ensure that those dollars are spent as best as possible and we get the biggest bang for the buck, and this would just help us be able to do that. Representative Hakem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and testifiers, I, I think we've heard several comments about um, people who would be potentially impacted by this, whether it's resort owners or camps or people who live on lakes. And I think one thing they all have in common is that they really want a healthy lake. And so um, because we're seeing that it's it's water related recreations that are, are causing the transfer from lake to lake, I think it's imperative that especially the users of the lake, whether they are residential and, and only on that lake, they want their lake to be healthy, I think it's important that we we all play a, a piece in, in ensuring that going forward. And so I appreciate the, the bill being brought up and I appreciate the attention being put to it. I had a quick question. I know that there are licenses for canoes and, and we have other kinds of um, watercraft, especially now today, like the paddle boards that go from lake to lake. Are they ever seen as an issue or something? I know that I don't think they're licensed, maybe just registered and, and just wondering how that's looked at. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chair, representatives, they are registered, depending if they're over 10 feet, I believe is the number. They do require a registration fee. Um, they certainly can be a vector. Anything that can contain water, you know, they have a little handle spout. Some of them have cup holders or whatever. If they aren't drained completely and washed and, and taken care of, just like any other water-related equipment that we have, uh, the trampolines, right? If you leave a trampoline in there, the anchor rope could get contaminated, things like that. So it's important to realize anything that you have in the water could be a possible vector. We're working with duck hunters, for example, as they're pulling out their decoys in the muck, making mm -hmm. sure that their duck boats are clean and their decoys are decontaminated, you know, things like that. So every, every place we can work to educate people, we're trying to do so right now. Thank you. Rep. Dimble. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with regard to the grants to, uh, to the lake uh, associations, can the smaller lake associations utilize in-kind grants with volunteer time and things, or does it have to be a dollar for dollar? Chairman, committee members, um, they can they can use that. Typically, what they're using for invasive aquatic plants, you need a permit. So coming to us with the grant program is kind of a one-stop shop. It makes it easy for the applicant to apply for the grant and get the permit at the same time. Um, Typically, the grant is helping pay for the actual herbicide that they're using. Very good. I uh, don't know if I made the call to the audience, if anybody wants to testify for or against the bill. Um, seeing no further questions or testifiers, um, I'll uh, renew <clears throat> my motion that uh, and look back here now. Do you remember? You can you can do it too. House file 1885. Yeah, be referred to ways and means. And uh, roll call has been requested. Uh, and uh, so the clerk will take the roll. The chair votes aye. Becker Fenn? Yes. Lewick? No. Acom? Yes. Anderson? No. Ho? Yes. Claflin? Yes. Fabian? No. Gomez? Yes. 
Green? No. Hansen? Yes. Heinzman? No. Lippert? Yes. Uh, Wiginius? Yes. We our, our tally is uh, nine in favor and five opposed, so 1885 is on its way to Ways and Means. Thank you, Representative Martin.